This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. This week we are in Vienna. We are coming off the heels of an event here in town sponsored by Scholarium, which is a, a private independent school here in Vienna, which promotes Austrian economics. So in that sense, it's very much like the Mises Institute in the U.S. It is run by our friend Rahim Tahizadegan, one of four co-authors that many of you will remember for a book we showcased on the old podcast called The Austrian School for Investors, Investing Between Inflation and Deflation. He has a new book out, again with some co-authors, dealing with negative interest rates and zero interest rates and the cultural effects of that phenomenon. In particular, talking to him offline, he suggests that the book is in many ways an elaboration of Guido Holzman's great book, The Ethics of Money Production, and we featured that book in the past as well. So I know that many of you are going to be interested in our topic today. But first and foremost, I just want to mention that we had an, a, an excellent event in Vienna over the past weekend at the Coburg Palace, featured Hans Hoppe. We were commemorating the 70th anniversary of Human Action. There was also an award given to Professor Hoppe, the Roland Bader Award. Uh, Lou Rockwell has received that in the past. And the man behind all of this is Rahim, who has really put together uh, the brain and the uh, funding and the uh, logistic support for what is, in effect, a very strong and vibrant working Mises Institute here in the home of Austrian economics in Vienna. So all that said, Rahim, it is wonderful to see you again. Welcome to Vienna. Well, it was an excellent conference. Uh, just tell us briefly, we were talking earlier offline, your vision for Scholarium and what it should be and what it means. Well, a scholarium is from the old term for the university. It was the Universitas Magistorum at Scholarium. And so it's supposed to be what the university could have been, but was never allowed to be. So a center of interdisciplinary understanding of what's going on in our world and understanding society and learning together. And that tends to be replaced by a focus on teaching and the certificates and curricula and nowadays safe spaces uh, mm -hmm. for not thinking, <laughs> not being pushed to think, being prevented from thinking and understanding. Uh, and uh, so we think it's a very important niche to somehow continue the tradition of very realistic down to earth social sciences of which the Austrian Econ School of Economics is a very important part. And how do you feel the Austrian school is faring in Austria today, in today's Austria? The, how well known are Hayek and Mises? Uh, is this something where in the business world, in the banking world, people are aware of their own birthright, so to speak? Uh, when we started 13 years ago, not at all. Hayek has a little renown as the sort of Nobel laureate. Uh, Sure. Uh, and then interest was increasing in 2007 and 8, as usual with economic crises, people are looking for alternatives. And uh, there seems to be an increase in interest right now, which potentially isn't a very good sign about the state of the economy and society, <laughs> I'd say, but still a good sign for the Austrian school. So interest is increasing and uh, what's more important is not the quantity of people really looking into it, being interested in it. I think more important is the quality of the people and that I'm really proud of uh, that we attract, I think, the brightest people that are still here, mm -hmm. <laughs> the best entrepreneurs, investors, but also some of the best uh, sci social scientists, I'd say, who start taking an active interest in Austrian economics uh, and that's wonderful. Well, the irony, of course, is that here we are just a few blocks away across the street from the University of Vienna, not too far from the Viennese Chamber of Commerce, all these places. I'm staying near a couple of Mises' coffee shops. So here we are. And for those of us who are so-called American Austrians, of course, it's exciting and interesting to come here. So uh, we appreciate it. And I'm sure some of our listeners uh, would enjoy maybe having a Mises Institute event in Vienna in the future and, in, and having more of us fly over uh, to, to really spend some time here. Of course, uh, you wrote a book called Austrian Economics for Investors, Investing Between Inflation and Deflation. And our listeners may recall that Rahim is also a principal in an investment house called Incrementum in Liechtenstein. Uh, just briefly refresh our memory on that book and, and the goal when you wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's really bridging theory and practice and uh, 
that I think was crucial in the original Austrian school. It uh, was never just academics. It was all, always a mix of academics, entrepreneurs and investors and the bankers uh, of the time. Uh, so that's what we try to do. It's uh, make practical investors understand the value of theory while at the same time try to apply theory, the current events and current financial markets and show how they can be used not only to understand what's going on in the markets, but uh, how even advice for investors can be de deduced from that. Uh, and uh, so we discovered quite a lot of uh, uh, wisdom and insights within the tradition of the Austrian school, which are very relevant for day-to-day -day investors. Well, of course, you and I both get this a lot, the big criticism of the Austrian school, too theoretical. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's the practical application? Of course, people also want to know if you can't time the booms and busts, mm -hmm. what good is it? That's sort of the devil's advocate critique. Yes, yes. Uh, then I, I think it's crucial to know what you can't know, and there the Austrian school helps a lot. So even if you know that you can't time, of course, you can apply that insight, and it's an important insight, and that's... Uh, uh, it's all about that. I mean, realizing what you can know, what other people can know, and how you apply that to investing. And I think some, those are some of the most crucial insights. Uh, they lead you to a certain uh, mix of portfolios, lead you thinking in scenarios, and really try to look into the consequences for portfolios by different scenarios uh, and try to remain liquid when no one else is. So the, your new book is called Zero Interest Rates. Tell us about it. Uh, why did you write it? And what's the goal behind the book? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, in the European Union, the ECB has already gone to zero nominal interest rates, uh, something the Fed most likely will go to uh, soon or next. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to look at is not only describe this new normality in uh, monetary economics uh, and what it uh, means and how it's got there, but also see at the consequences. Uh, and I think those consequences are overseen to a very large extent. Uh, the economic consequences are more obvious, but even those uh, aren't really uh, seen and discussed as they should. But what's more important, more profound, uh, is that we've, the more we looked into it, uh, we've discovered a lot of social phenomena and political phenomena of our times are quite related to monetary politics and are in a sense... It, aggravated by this kind of monetary policy and uh, that's what really drew our interest and I think that's the most original part of our book is really the most comprehensive and detailed analysis of the social, economical and political consequences of this kind of monetary policy and of course then the question where this monetary policy is heading uh, and what it means for society and, and the economy. Well, it's a big question. I mean, it might be the biggest unwritten story of our times. Now, you mentioned that negative interest rates are probably coming to the United States. Alan Greenspan has said as much. Uh, they're not here yet. Um, but I want to talk about the idea. I mean, have Europeans really grasped this? Because it hasn't come down to the retail uh, bank deposit level yet. This is in the form of, of both sovereign and corporate debt that, uh, that is yielding negative interest. No, right, right now it's reaching uh, retail deposits. It, it is uh, reaching retail, retail even, yeah. because people talk about, for instance, Germans being famous as savers. Yeah. Yes. I mean, what, psychologically, how are Europeans going to respond to this? Um, once we reach uh, negative nominal interest rates... Uh, at was, the retail level? At the retail level, uh, of course, the increases the pressure on uh, trying to invest in wealth assets, uh, but uh, most uh, people are reluctant to do so, and, and particularly in Austria, but to a lesser case in Germany, uh, people are reluctant to engage in the financial markets, they tend to be conservative, uh, they tend to be afraid of the volatility in the markets, and I, I think it's not too irrational to react to that. It's, it's all, also prevented uh, those places from some of the distortions that you have in the markets right now, I'd say. Uh, so I think we'll see, of course, uh, people shifting into cash and other cash-like assets like gold, uh, uh, even potentially be, it'll be good for cryptocurrencies uh, and so on. And when uh, people move into cash, uh, which is already happening, I, I know entrepreneurs who are withdrawing money and uh, really having big cash deposits uh, in like, safe places. Uh, um, uh, and that way, of course, you escape uh, the 
nominal negative uh, interest rates. And that's why the ECB has, has already discussed at length how to react onto that. And there's a paper proposing to how to impose this kind of negative interest rates by artificial uh, exchange rates between cash and digital money or by going full way and producing kind of central bank digital currency uh, and so on. So they tend to see that there's a problem. Uh, and the problem is more psychological, is that once people go the whole way in withdrawing from the banking system, that of course is a show of distrust and it may catch on, it may even become a domino effect. Uh, and uh, of course the banks are under a lot of pressure uh, under these uh, uh, zero interest rates, low interest rates surroundings, uh, so that might just kick, <laughs> you know, final kick for some of those banks. Uh, um, so that's, I, I think, what we'll see, uh, moving to cash, and uh, there's uh, quite an awareness uh, that, uh, that there'll be a challenge. Uh, so in Austria, even uh, the politics has reacted in a way under popular pressure to ensure uh, by law that cash will remain will remain to be used right but isn't it possible to start removing large bills from circulation the ecb could just start pulling 100 euro notes or whatever it is and make it very difficult yeah. to have much in cash yes that it could do of course uh, i don't think that that's too likely because at the same time that's really a psychological push and most people here aren't ready to go fully without mm -hmm. cash uh, now of course i mean if you're a young digital native there's no problem with that but we tend to have a very high turnover of cash. So if it's a very drastic uh, break with that tradition by law or by really uh, withdrawing banknotes from circulation, I think they'll push the movement uh, uh, to distrust uh, not only banks, but the political authorities, the central bank and so on. Uh, and that's, of course, what they're afraid of. So they try to, and it's, I think, what's all monetary policy is about right now, to don't push the psychological triggers too much. So it's a kind of mm -hmm. uh, like behind the facades, trying to be creative in a way. And I, I think that's dangerous, of course, because uh, uh, it's under the surface. Uh, uh, you want to increase the temperature of the water slowly <laughs> so that the frog doesn't jump out uh, in a way. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's why... Unfortunately, since we're living in interesting times in monetary economics uh, and Miss Lagarde, who is now heading the ECB, is a very bright uh, person, but uh, tends to be of the creative sort, which means she's really thinking about how to continue that kind of um, direction of monetary policy in an innovative way, which means in a way which most people don't realize what's going mm -hmm. on until it's too late. Now, do you think she's an ideologue, a true believer, or do you think she's more of a technocrat who just wants to sort of kick the can down the road? Definitely. She's a technocrat. She's an opportunist that we know from her engagement in, in French politics. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a letter reveal that she wrote to Macron before. It's so like, I'm really a technocrat who wanted to make a career. Uh, but she is, of course, as a technocrat, she's a prior to a competent person. So uh, she knows a lot <laughs> uh, of what there is to know about uh, the current levels of monetary policy. Uh, and she will continue this technocratic way of do everything it takes to steer mm. this, kind of, <laughs> this kind of broken plane uh, uh, that current monetary policy is. Because, of course, it's, it's not working uh, and the whole theoretical premise is flawed. Uh, uh, but still, it seems that there's no alternative. Uh, and that's well, what technocrats do. Uh, if there seems to be no alternative, they just try to push the levers and keep it going as long as they can. What's interesting to me is in American, obviously, there's a lot of cultural diversity within the Eurozone. So in Sweden, virtually everything's cashless. I've noticed, uh, to my great pleasure, in Vienna, there are a lot of places that are cash only. There seems mm. to be much more of a cash-centric society here, yeah. which suggests it won't be so simple uh, to do away with and make everyone pay for things with their phones. Um, right now, about half of all European sovereign debt, something like $5 trillion U.S. out there, uh, trades negative. Uh, something like 20% of European corporate debt, something like 12% worldwide debt, which is both European sovereign, Japanese, uh, corporate in, in both. So who's buying this $12 trillion in negative yielding debt? Are these institutional investors, central banks? It's certainly not individuals, presumably. 
Uh, individuals as well, I mean, individuals are pushed by their banks, basically, because once you have zero to negative interest rates, uh, once you reach a certain amount in your account, you get a call by your bank and they tell you politely that you should do something with that. And uh, uh, there are even like limits. Uh, I mean, I've been called if there's more than 100,000 euro on some accounts. It's impossible. You need to move it to another place. You can't have more than 100,000 on uh, that account. And then, of course, they suggest uh, either you take risk, and if you don't want to take risk, you buy sovereign debt. Uh, it's like it replaces basically bank accounts and deposits. So it's a modern way to have a deposit. It's not really an investment, I'd say. It's just a way of hoarding if hoarding is made impossible mm -hmm. <laughs> by monetary policy. Uh, and a uh, very odd thing is that one of the best performing assets in the last year was the 100 year. Uh, so sovereign debt by Austria, <laughs> issued mm -hmm. by Austria, which is, of course, a very absurd idea to have for a hundred years uh, such a low interest uh, they're offering right now, um, which is absurd. But it's absurd as an investment. It's not absurd if you realize that it's really uh, that's where modern monetary theory wants us to go. It's basically central bank money uh, because the central bank is monetizing all sovereign debt. Mm -hmm. It's basically issuing a guarantee, it's like a bank mm -hmm. guarantee, and that was that's what has been happening since 2007, 2008. That basically there's a central bank guarantee for all kinds of sovereign debt. Uh, so if you're above like say the if you're a saver if you're saving uh, sooner or later you reach the level where you realize oh my god even just to hold cash that nowadays means i got to buy sovereign debt uh, mm -hmm. uh, if i like it or not and then of course people are happy about the uh, the performance as well because the more people are pushed into those kinds of assets uh, uh, the better the uh, development uh, of, of the courses of the prices of, of those uh, instruments. And of course, you know what you're losing. You lock in the rate of your loss. So the uncertainty is reduced. Yes, yes, in a way. But it's not really about the interest. Uh, so it's not, it's not an investment. It's not like it's a not dividend. An it's just holding it. And the same happens in the stock market. It's not really about the dividends. It's just uh, holding on to something that's scarcer than the money that's produced. Uh, so I think that's the main point. It's really hoarding papers, which are more limited in a way uh, than the <laughs> digital central bank money that's produced. Uh, and it's uh, the exponential lengthening of the balance sheets of the central banks. So while the ECB has actual nominal interest rates on reserves at the ECB, and in the US, uh, the Fed funds rate is still positive, it's 1.75%. Uh, interest on excess reserves, which the Fed pays to, to uh, on bank reserves, is still positive as well. But if you believe, as I certainly do, that real inflation in the US mm -hmm. is Higher than 1.75%. In effect, we have negative interest yes. rates of a sense. Yeah, definitely. You have real negative real interest rates, and we've had that for a long time. And uh, the difference is not this big. You know, it looks as if the difference was large with the Fed being able to increase interest rates. And uh, that, of course, is seen in, in the EU uh, and by the ECP as a potential upside effect to say well look at the us it's possible to reduce uh, uh, this outstanding liquidity but i think that's really a big misunderstanding what was going on i i think the main reason that the uh, us uh, looked uh, better than the european union was for errors happening within the european union it's like the the saying goes among the blind the one-eyed is king and i mm -hmm. think the us for a while seemed to be more one-eyed mm -hmm. uh, because we have some self-imposed blindness uh, in the european union particularly by its elite and you see that in the reaction to the brexit uh, we're really like risking a fallout with one of the most important economies of europe uh, the uk uh, and it's really a colossal damage that's happening uh, there, a very short-sighted interest uh, um, instead of just like understanding uh, where the British are coming from and where mm -hmm. they'd be going and still remain friendly and, and open. Um, you know, there are all kinds of uh, potential uh, havoc, political havoc created. Uh, and then uh, most crucial, I think the typical reaction by the EU, EU uh, elites to seeing, of course, that there are problems and they are challenged by those problems. And one of the most important uh, efforts they've done 
was to persecute what they, what they presume as one of the problems of tax evasion uh, in the EU. So they're really afraid of like people withdrawing uh, money and uh, moving away with, the, with their assets as a kind of... We don't have capital controls yet, but they're afraid of like people moving out of the high-tax countries in the EU. And so we obviously have a big brain drain happening right mm -hmm. now. It's a big brain drain from Germany and France in particular. Austria to a slighter extent, uh, but as well happening, what this brain drain mean is like the best entrepreneurs, investors, particularly the young among them, tend to leave those countries and they are leaving with their assets uh, uh, if they're able to. And what the EU elites try to do is to really push down hard on this kind of offshore banking. And what they've created without, I mean, really stupid <laughs> uh, pressure they, they build up, what they've created in the end is the last remaining tax haven in the world is the United States mm -hmm. right now. So I think that's one of the main big advantages for the U.S. compared to the EU. So the EU has really improved the situation for, for the U.S. I think that was the reason why there was a move of assets into the dollar. Uh, and uh, I know, I mean, most uh, uh, companies created offshore now are LLC companies in the United States uh, because, of course, the U.S. is one of the big geopolitical blocks that the EU can't force to reveal all mm -hmm. kind of data mm -hmm. about their citizens. Uh, so that's the reason that has happened. And I think that shift in assets uh, wasn't really like a sign of the U.S. economy showing any kind of sustainable recovery um, or anything else. I was really just self-imposed blindness by the U.E. listen self-destruction uh, of uh, wealth, capital and industries within Europe uh, and that somehow made the dollar look much better uh, in the short and uh, medium term and I think that's the reason uh, but now we are seeing and realizing that there was no sustainable economic recovery within the United States uh, and we see that the central banks I mean have no alternative to just continue what they've been doing and we've seen in the repo markets uh, recently uh, that there is no sign that they can just go on and withdraw liquidity from the markets to the opposite they have mm -hmm. to even just keep it going and continue injecting liquidity continue quantitative easing uh, and obviously there's political pressure as well i mean if you stop that kind of bonanza obviously there'll be drastic uh, reactions on the markets and uh, uh, that of course isn't the best circumstance to be re-elected right. uh, wherever you coming and, from and, and as I'm sure some of our listeners know, in just the past couple of months with the repo liquidity offerings from the Fed, they've undone a significant amount of the tapering of QE, which they supposedly started a couple of years ago. Um, it's interesting that you bring up the artificiality of money flowing into the United States as the least dirty shirt in the laundry, mm -hmm. as we say. But of course, this also affects Treasury bonds. In other words, a 10 year Treasury note is, is still positive. It's 1.75 compared to Euro debt. That still is, is there's, there's an artificial market created mm -hmm. for US Treasury debt that I think gives us a false impression of the market for that debt and also the overall yeah. health. Yeah. Well, I, I think we, without the uh, virtual guarantee by uh, the Fed uh, for there's kind of backstop. assets, yeah, there's a backstop. Sure. I mean, if the rest of the world were to look at the United States, mm -hmm and our debt and entitlement yes. promises in the future, and our balance sheet and our income statement, our p &L, mm. and say, and then Congress politically, they'd say this country's never gonna get its act together. Yeah. And if I'm gonna invest in its debt, I need junk bond rates. Yeah. That's what would happen in a rational world. Yes. Um, you know, earlier you said that individuals in fact do uh, buy negative yield debt, but there's also institutions and banks that buy that. Some of that sometimes they're required by charter to yes. hold a certain amount of, let's say, uh, Swiss francs or or uh, ECB uh, b bonds from a particular country. So when a bank, e but even an individual, when a bank calls them up and says, "Well, we have a hundred a hundred thousand euro limit or something like that," I mean, that's not a market for negative <laughs> interest rates. I mean, this is these are machinations which are causing people to buy these. This isn't the market. Yeah. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, what he's just mentioned is quite important in, in the EU. I mean, those sovereign debts consider one of the most conservative ways to invest. Uh, uh, and there was some truth to it. And, and before, it tended to be not correlated with the stock market 
right now that of course that has changed so it's really an artificial <laughs> asset class uh, right now and it's highly correlated with the stock market and that's a part of why we talk about the everything bubble uh, right mm -hmm. now so uh, mm -hmm. but of course laws don't change when reality changes so mm -hmm. you're still you're legally applied as a pension mm -hmm. fund and so on uh, all kinds of institutional investors or kinds of banks who need to remain liquidity remain liquid and, and have liquidity uh, you have no alternative no legal alternative to uh, sort right. of debt right and of course austrians argue that interest rates represent a meeting of time preference between a saver and a borrower and so interest rates can never be negative uh, some of our friends i'm sure lagarde i'm sure paul krugman dispute this um, but what we have to understand, I think, here is that they don't really believe that there are laws of economics. In other words, economies can be commanded by legislative fiat, by central banks, and, and these things can just be imposed. Yes, yes, that's something Bern Baverk realized uh, a long time ago, that it's basically power against economic law. Uh, but uh, power, of course, in the short term and medium term is powerful. <laughs> Uh, so it seems that they've been right for a long time and mm -hmm. they may continue to be right for quite a while. Now, one thing that, that's interesting about the ECB and the Eurozone is that there is still this tension between one currency, one centrally controlled currency for all the Eurozone countries, mm -hmm. but yet they are still issuing their own sovereign debt. Yeah. We still have Greek bonds, we still yeah. have German bonds. Yeah. Um, you know, we have $1, uh, yeah. in, in a sense, we have the same thing. We have state bonds in the U.S., mm -hmm. but they're, it, it's, it's quite different. I mean, what, what, how does this tension work? Are there still uh, profligate countries and conservative countries? Do the Germans still sort of uh, feel like the Greeks are taking advantage of them? Do these kind of tensions that I always thought the ECB made worse, yeah. not better. Yes, definitely. I mean, the euro is a political project and uh, was a project to unify the continent. But of course, the opposite is happening. And that's... That's the same story with almost every government intervention where you have power trying to replace economic law. Uh, usually the opposite happens of what you intend. Uh, and then it's not obvious if they're really that stupid or there's some evil behind that. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, the EU was never so fragmented as it's before. It's not only Brexit. There's many countries... Uh, quite a reluctance and skepticism towards the EU elites and there's even talk about moving out of the euro, moving out even of the European Union among uh, representative uh, political parties. Uh, uh, so these tensions are very high and unfortunately these tensions then get a nationalistic overtone. So in Greece uh, uh, we had, of course, they tried to portray the Germans as the Nazis uh, because they're imposing uh, this austerity, uh, this austerity uh, in a certain way, uh, and, and I think had quite an impact on Merkel, who is the uh, opportun opportunist by definition. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, kind of uh, migration policy that she imposed on other countries was, in a way, a reaction to those kinds of tensions and and uh, perception as the germans as being too austere too strict and in a way the fascists uh, of the continent uh, uh, and there you see without understanding economics and uh, politicizing all those uh, things uh, you create tensions and we see that on on the local level we see it on the national level a lot uh, and i think a lot about the political polarization that's happening in europe uh, can really be explained to a large extent by monetary policy Mm -hmm. We were speaking earlier offline of the rural versus urban tension, mm. particularly in Austria, where Vienna is truly the only big city. Yeah. But we see this in the UK. Of course, there's lots mm. of cities there. Yeah. Uh, we see this in Germany. Yeah. Um, but you know, how, how does the average Austrian or the average Viennese feel about Brussels? I, I mean, mm. it, it can't be any better than how they feel about Vienna. Well, the average Viennese is part of the, well, let's say the influential average Viennese, about which you read, who's mm -hmm. publishing potentially is part of the urban elite. And of course, he's very thankful for this kind of cosmopolitan liberty he or she thinks the EU has made possible. Uh, that, of course, is a very short term memory in history because passports are a fairly recent invention in the continent. So it's just like after the Second World War, trying. Uh, 
uh, to open up again uh, what was normal before, of course. And then we had the experience with the Iron Curtain here mm -hmm. in Austria, where our sister cities were mm -hmm. uh, really separated from us. Uh, and so that's a profound uh, influence on, on the thinking of the Viennese, who are, of course, happy that now they can go to Bratislava and mm -hmm. Prague and, and Hungary and so on now without crossing borders, uh, mm -hmm. without stopping even the car um, and so on. Uh, but it's a wrong attribution to the EU uh, because it's something that would have happened anyway. I mean, it's, it's not even the essential part of the EU because the EU is a continuation. Of course, we had the economic uh, union before and uh, you have all kinds of trying to get together on, on a national, uh, supranational level, which of course makes sense. You want to open up for trade, you want to maybe even have common standards, you need to have common standards for railways and so on. But you don't need a, a Brussels elite imposing that from the top because mm -hmm. it's something that's obvious even from the bottom mm -hmm. up uh, getting there. Uh, but uh, the Viennese are not typical for the Austrians, uh, I'd say, and that's the urban-rural divide. And I think one major reason for the urban-rural divide is, of course, the Cantillon effect, uh, that the monetary policy starts in the urban centers, the financial centers, uh, and that really leads to different interests of the classes on the countryside. You're among the last recipients of that mm -hmm. uh, created uh, money. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people here living in Vienna are not really productive in an uh, entrepreneurial sense. So I, so I won't advise if you want to have create income as an entrepreneur to move to Vienna. Vienna is a great place as is Paris, but Vienna is of course much higher quality of life. If you have wealth, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't need to generate your income here, if you're just here for spending, that's wonderful. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful place to be. Uh, but that's, uh, so a large part of the population are of course recipients of transfers, but, uh, What's more important is the unseen transfers that are happening to the monetary policy. Uh, and that is, of course, that the whole production structure shifts away from a market economy. Uh, I think the definition of the market economy by Ludwig von Mises is a very profound insight. He compared it to a kind of dollar or cent democracy and maybe misleading to term it that way. But what he wanted to express is that it's basically decisions by the consumers and the savers by their individual decisions that determine the production structure. And of course, the monetary policy we have right now is moving away, is rigging this kind of voting mechanism. So the production structure uh, uh, represents less and less individual decisions. It still rather represents consumers' decisions, but the saver is like kicked out of the game and it's really what Keynes maybe predicted, uh, but in a way he made it happen, uh, uh, as we always have in economics, if the model and reality don't match, uh, uh, the worse for reality, <laughs> because power <laughs> is influenced, of course, yeah. by bad uh, economists and yeah. bad economics. So Keynes wrote about the euthanasia of the saver. Uh, and that's what's happening. So the saver, in a sense, is like uh, dying out in, uh, in the markets as a voice. Uh, so it's a consumption-oriented place, and that are the parts of the Viennese economy that are thriving still, tourism and uh, so on. And then you have a whole new field in the production structure, which is not really related to any investment or saving decisions. It's subsidies. It's, it's what uh, David Graeber calls the bullshit jobs. Of course, he has no clue about uh, sound economics, so he doesn't really see where they're coming from. But those are basically those kind of NGO style, but not really NGO bodies and mm -hmm. institutions and pseudo companies doing things which don't really have value in the long term mm -hmm. because it's not the choice of savers. No one would mm -hmm. ever invest his own money in those things that are happening, but they are happening anyways and they provide jobs for short term. And I'd say a lot of the VNEs of today are in those kinds of bullshit jobs, mm -hmm. which are either really like close to the city administration, but we have a huge aura around that of pseudo companies and pseudo NGOs. Uh, and stuff like that, which do cultural, artistic uh, things, educational things, no one really cares about. No one would really uh, go for if it wasn't highly subsidized. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's 
the way it, it happens in, in Vienna and of course in other places <laughs> it uh, tends to be worse uh, uh, but still on the countryside we have real people doing real work <laughs> I'd say hardworking uh, people uh, of course uh, are within uh, the, the misallocations mal uh, misallocations of the production structure and the monetary system uh, but still there's a kind of impression that they are losing out uh, and if they compare themselves to the urban elites it's hard for them to understand that you have a hard-working like craftsman and he compares himself to the sociologist living in Vienna and being employed in some kind of bullshit project uh, of course you tend to have a tendency to react against those kind of elites and ask yourself what's going on there is a big con game what are they doing in the cities uh, and of course part of that is misunderstanding that we even be like anti-intellectual anti-city sentiments but you can't separate that uh, he's deplorable yeah yeah <laughs> you have the term deplorables mm -hmm. uh, right and that's how then the urban elites of course see those uneducated unwashed masses uh, uh, but the problem is they are not really an elite in a productive sense it's not there not, not an in elite. natural sense yeah not in the natural but it's sense it's so difficult to trace all of these non-economic jobs that perhaps wouldn't exist absent monetary policy yeah. is very hard to trace and, yes. and connect and yes. the Kentelon effect yes. uh, yeah. plays into this yeah. and I worry about that you talk about farther away from city centers and monetary mm -hmm. centers I live in Auburn Alabama and we have an absolute building boom going on condos everywhere in my town I think yeah Auburn Alabama is pretty far from New York City and Washington DC, maybe I should be worried. I think I'm at, I'm at that tail end yeah. uh, of the, or the high water mark of the boom. So getting to these, I love these broader questions, that these broader issues that you're bringing up, but I wanna talk about the cultural impact of zero interest rates or negative interest rates, which is what your new book is about. So give us, in, give us the English uh, subtitle for the book as best you can. It's about the zombification of society. We changed the subtitles, <laughs> even though it's uh, by heart. It's the zero interest trap is the title. And then I think it's about, uh, we changed the subtitle to make it more relevant for a U.S. audience and how the Fed, uh, I, 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 I can't give you the detail of one I have in my mind, how the Fed uh, won't be able to help itself going the same way the ECB is going. Uh, so that's basically what can you learn from the European mm -hmm. experience so far in monetary policy uh, and what does it mean uh, for the US uh, and what to expect. Uh, uh, but a large part is really detailed analysis of those cultural societal effects and really it is hard to trace questions and trying to see that in real phenomena and what's happening right now, what markets look like, uh, how people behave, what jobs they are having uh, and trying to look at those hard to trace uh, dynamics uh, behind it. You know, David Sockman points out that when we, when we have uh, a rigged Fed funds rate or a rigged ECB uh, reserve bank rate, we don't know the real price of anything. So you're talking really about bullshit jobs, yeah. the sociologists at the University of Vienna, mm -hmm. how many of them do we need? Mm -hmm. And how many farmers do we need making cheese? We don't know. Yeah. But we know we have too many one. <laughs> yes. I don't know if we have too few of the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what are some of the cultural consequences? I think a lot of our listeners have read Guido Holzman's book, mm -hmm. The Ethics of Money Production. Yeah. If you haven't, please email me, ping me to get yourself a copy. It's a pretty thin book. Um, Rahim's new book is being translated in English, originally in German, yes. so that we're going to be selling that at some point in, soon in the Mises.org bookstore. Um, so, how you know, we, we think about the cultural impact on lazy government. Hoppe talks about when governments are able to monetize debt and democratic voters want lots of stuff now, sure, give it to the mass. So we see how that corrupts government. But, but culturally and socially, how do zero or negative interest rates, uh, you know, affect us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, obviously, it's short-termism uh, that we'll see, but it's not as easy as that because it's not really what one would expect is that you really have people now living in the moment and enjoying uh, the consumption possibilities they have, and that's not really what, what we're seeing long-term. It's a kind of stressful short-termism uh, that's mm -hmm. happening, uh, and, uh, of course, it's a quite complicated economic uh, explanation behind that, and we try to trace this a kind of short-term hedonism happening at the same time kind of being stressed out uh, uh, and and this kind of uh, shocks or unequal 
devaluation uh, uh, that's happening and that's pushing people uh, and in particular the young of course are seeing with the asset price inflation that is getting more and more difficult to set yourself up in a typical lifestyle having your car having your home uh, and so on and just finance that by being a hardworking person uh, and we see phenomena like that everywhere so we have uh, a kind of artificial stress on people which is not due to their own decisions to be like saving and prudent uh, but it's they have a possibility to consume beforehand uh, and then of course they feel that kind of pressure uh, which they can really understand where it's com coming from and a lot of it is coming through this uh, kind of devaluation pressures uh, that are happening and to cope with those pressures we see a lot of interesting social phenomena uh, which we call, we call deviance uh, uh, phenomena where even like middle class sell people go for things that uh, tend to be at the fringe of society like they imitate you know, gangster style styles mm -hmm. tattoos are mm -hmm. uh, exploding um, mm -hmm. uh, in a way and we try to understand those uh, exaggeration of social trends uh, and we can a lot can learn a lot from japan of course totally different culture but we can see how monetary policy there has exaggerated some of those of course only in the cultural context of japan to be understood but very similar uh, style like phenomena that we see mm -hmm. in, in in the west uh, so we try to build on that experience that we can have by really observing japanese society and what's happening there um, and there of course we see a big of uh, cultural patterns emerging uh, like in particular very odd industries uh, uh, in Japan, it's uh, it's a whole branch of this kind of platonic prostitution you have happening. Mm -hmm. You have people mm -hmm. who have jobs as actors playing out parents, ideal parents, mm -hmm. and they are hired for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, only happens in Japan in a way due to the uh, peculiarities of Japanese societies. But there are lots of things, uh, uh, interesting little uh, seem to be anecdotes, but they are happening more frequently. So people ask themselves, what's happening there? Is it really like getting the society going on the train? What's going on there? And then you have the powerful counter reactions to that, of course, as well. And I think some of that is behind the left-right uh, split, mm -hmm. which, of course, tends to look like a cultural war even uh, mm -hmm. uh, right now. And I think this cultural war aspect is due to the exaggeration of some uh, potential cultural patterns which are in a way evolved, safety evolves for the pressure that's built up by monetary mm -hmm. policy and it's ways of people coping with those pressures and uh, uh, one of the way of coping with it is, is kind of conspicuous consumption we see in hypermorality. Uh, it's like uh, people really in a way consuming virtuousness by uh, signaling, as it's called virtual signaling in English, I think it's a misnomer because um, it's not really like signaling from evolutionary theory. Um, it's something more uh, uh, complex or odd uh, in a certain way, but I think phenomena like that are closely linked to the exaggerations produced by monetary policy. And then you can see if you compare uh, what a society would be like if it really had very low interest rates, and then you see, of course, the imposition intervention. As usual, the results by intervention are paradoxical. They're the opposite of what mm -hmm. you'd expect mm -hmm. in a real uh, low interest rate society. And by seeing this mismatch, you can understand a lot of the pressures and how they would work. Uh, it's their way through society. And uh, that helps us to explain a lot of current phenomena, uh, which you'll see if you're following like social media, bubbles and so on and you understand how these kind of bubble those bubbles emerging are not really just due to social media uh, mm -hmm. they are really there on a more profound level uh, it's uh, things happening faster than they would happen on a natural scale and people reacting to those things uh, and then people reacting to the people reacting onto those things and uh, those i think these kind of dynamics explain a lot of the uh, uh, atrocity uh, in the political discourse uh, that we are seeing and in lifestyle decisions so we look a lot into lifestyle even fashion and so on and try to really analyze mm. these detailed phenomena and how they may be linked not in a causal not in a mono causal deterministic way of course we're not claiming that monetary policy explains everything we want to see what is it densifying exaggerating and how are people reacting to that 
uh, understand that they are not understanding the economic uh, mm -hmm. background of why mm -hmm. those things are happening. And uh, uh, we, we've realized that you can really explain a lot by doing that. Wow. And I think that's the value of, of the zero interest trap, uh, the book we've written together. And of course, the Japanese have been at this since about 1990. Yeah. Yes. So we have several decades there. And one thing that has definitely infected the West uh, via Japan, in a sense, is fewer kids. Yes. Uh, you know, lower birth rates. Uh, there's yeah. no question about that. Now, when you bring up the idea, this is interesting to me, of a middle class guy maybe adopting uh, the look or the jargon of street culture. Yeah. You know, sometimes the middle class guy will also go the other way. And yeah. even though he has yes. a middle class income, mm -hmm. he uh, maybe buys an Audi or a Mercedes on credit mm -hmm. when he should be buying a Ford yes. or, uh, you know, a, a a more modest yeah. car so yeah. it works it works a lot of different ways of course i mean those are the more obvious ways of short termism of capital consumption uh, and so on but what's really interesting is the more complex paradoxical things which you don't see in, on, on the first order analysis and only the second third order uh, analysis well realistically when when might we expect this book in english uh, pretty soon i mean it's translation's finished uh, okay. so i think maybe next week or oh, the week okay. after Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we might have that by Christmas or even New Year's in English. Um, so final question for you. Uh, you know, what can average people do? This is sort of where the rubber meets the road. I'm sure everyone asks mm -hmm. you this, and I'm sure uh, some of your answer involves precious metals or cryptos or whatever it might be. But, but, but beyond that, give us your thoughts. Uh, the most important thing is to reduce... Uh, uh, correlated risk is like having everything in the same basket and uh, in your... In Europe, it's quite common that you you earn, maybe you're a bank employee and you earn all your money by being an employee for the bank in euro and you keep those euro at the same bank uh, in euros uh, <laughs> as deposits. Uh, and there you can see, of course, you have a kind of lumping together of risks uh, and that makes you very fragile as a person and that I think then add to that that you're probably in debt uh, mm -hmm. uh, in euro uh, and that, of course, I think explains a lot of the cowardice uh, of the middle class and not daring to like really uh, react to the more lunatic uh, uh, things we see happening in, in, in politics right now and at the universities uh, and so on. Uh, so try to, of course, uh, increase your portfolio and that, of course, try to reduce currency risk foremost and uh, of course for someone in the US I won't have everything in dollar assets uh, uh, so you try you need to increase uh, this kind of range uh, and uh, then of course you uh, have that's that's the first thing to reduce those risks and and that's the hoarding part I'd say uh, and then uh, you'd go for the permanent portfolio approach if you don't have the time to really follow markets and have your own more entrepreneurial decisions, which of course you can do. If you say, no, I'm just a simple guy. I uh, just want to uh, reduce this kind of fragility. Then uh, of course that uh, uh, was uh, one of the main parts of our last book, the Austrian School for Investors in looking how to really set up a, a kind of portfolio, which takes least amount of thinking and, and active management, uh, mm -hmm. but still somehow set yourself up in a way that you're not too, uh, uh, that, that you're not too, not a hundred percent affected by the cyclical patterns we see emerging. And I think it becomes more and more important due to the high and historically unprecedented level of correlation between asset classes. And of course, then you look for uncorrelated asset classes uh, and precious metal play uh, a role in that cryptocurrency play a role in that i think that's one of the reasons we've seen emerge this whole new crypto thing is because people are really looking for uncorrelated assets and <laughs> looking everywhere on a worldwide level and that's of course maybe one of the more entrepreneurial uncertain answers to that uh, uh, kind of quest uh, and of course no one has the crystal ball and can tell you uh, what in the long run will be an un uncorrelated asset uh, uh, but that's the way a bit shifting uh, your mind view from the just performance and to uh, look at the correlation of the assets in your portfolio and your portfolio of course is much more than just what well, you have money it's your career decisions it's your life decisions and so on and if you look that through look for correlations and how you can reduce them and set you up in a, in a less fragile way 
Well, Rahim, that's, I think that's excellent. Uh, really appreciate your time today. And we will provide a link, ladies and gentlemen, with this podcast, both to his current book and his new book, so that you can get them for yourselves. Thank you so much, Rahim. Thanks a lot. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.